Our next speaker is Dr. Sally Eaton-Maganya from GI Research here in Carlsbad, and she's going to present to you a review of CBD synthetic diamonds seen in the GI laboratory. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'll be speaking uh, today about a review of CBD laboratory-grown diamonds, as we've seen at the GI laboratory. <clears throat> I wanted to start off first by reviewing some of the extraordinary physical properties that we see for diamond, as a lot of these have motivated a lot of the research that has happened for CVD diamond to use it as a, um, in both industrial and semiconductor applications. So we know that diamond has the highest hardness, it has the highest thermal conductivity, it has the highest molar density, the lowest compressibility and the highest sound propagation velocity of any terrestrial material. It also has extreme resistance to acids, corrosion, and radiation, and it has an extremely low thermal expansion coefficient. Now, I don't think anyone's going to buy a gem diamond because it has the highest sound propagation velocity, but I think this compilation of properties serves to illustrate how extraordinary and incomparable and unique diamond itself is, both as a material and as a gem. So chemical vapor deposition growth pr pr uh, proceeds by feeding in a, a hydrocarbon gas, uh, typically methane, about 1% and about 99% hydrogen into a vacuum chamber. And then these uh, gases are then excited by uh, microwave plasma. Now the reason why they feed in so much hydrogen is because CVD growth proceeds down in um, the graphite stability zone, so they need that much hydrogen in, their, in order to suppress the simultaneous growth of graphite. <clears throat> and the CVD technology has progressed enough that now they are able to create CVD diamonds that are chemically pure, that they are repeatable, and that they are able to tailor the physical properties to the desired application. So I'm showing here uh, a movie of how the, what's happening down at the growing diamond surface. Uh, the microwave plasma splits apart the gas molecules into fragments and radicals, and those diffuse down to the colder surface, the substrate, and precipitate out as solid carbon. Now what we typically see after they've grown for an extended period of time is we see uh, non-diamond carbon around the periphery. That is, they can either clean that off and put it back in the reactor and grow further, or they can just laser cut all that off and then facet it into a polished gem. So <clears throat> we've been looking at CVD diamonds for a, a lar large number of years at GIA for dating back at least 15, and we've seen quite a bit of evolution in the gem products that we've seen for CVD. Back in 2003, we were seeing very small uh, and all brown color, and we saw that for a fair number of years until about 2010 when we started seeing near colorless products. And then since then, we've started to see this evolution in size, and we've seen a number of size milestones in the years since then. The largest one that's been seen thus far is a 6.21 carat D color that we saw at a trade show back in June. We're also seeing some larger size uh, fancy color products as well. At the other end of the size spectrum, we're also seeing Meli-sized CVD diamonds also. Uh, this is one batch that was sent in to GIA for Meli sorting. Uh, it's about 30.8 total carat weight, and the vast majority of them are CVD. Now, we don't often see this percentage or this uh, high a quantity. We normally see far more natural or HPHT synthetics, but this does show that CVD melee are being produced um, for the trade. Now, this next series of slides is going to be documenting some of the trends that we've seen at GIA over the years. Uh, we have uh, put together a database of every CVD diamond that has come through our lab, either for uh, research purposes that was donated uh, or loaned to us by the manufacturer or that has been submitted uh, to us for grading reports. 
And so we've chronicled all the properties of about over a thousand of these CVDs. And I'm, uh, I'm going to summarize these data on the next couple of slides. Now, in some of the years, we didn't see a lot, so we've grouped some of these years together, uh, such as here and here. But we have data running up through June of 2018. Oops, sorry. So for this slide, I'm showing the weight distribution that we've seen over the years for CVD diamonds. Uh, back in the early years, we saw mostly diamonds that were less than half a carat. And as we've gone through time, we've seen that this has progressed into larger weights. So that in this year, we're seeing most of the diamonds that we're seeing are greater than one carat, and we're seeing a good percentage that are over two carats as well. This slide shows the color distribution that we've seen over the years for CVD grown diamonds. You'll see that the vast majority of them are in the near colorless range, from G up to about N. And we have a much smaller percentage that are what we would call in the colorless range of D to F. HPHT synthetics, we see a much higher percentage of those that are in the colorless range compared to the CVDs. Uh, we also, for the last couple of years, we have seen a fair number of faint or very light gray diamonds as well. Those were most likely intended to be on the D to Z scale, but they had enough grayish component that they were called uh, fancy gray instead. Among the, fancy, among the other fancy colors, we predominantly see uh, uh, CVDs that are pink in color, either from NV centers due to post-growth treatment or a 520 nanometer absorption band. Also in recent years, we have seen some green-blue uh, diamonds due to uh, post-growth radiation. Uh, this slide chronicles the amount of C uh, the quantity of CVDs that we have seen each year, and we're referencing that to the total intake of all diamonds submitted to GIA for grading reports, both D to Z and fancy color. So you can see over the years we have seen a dramatic increase in the total number of CVDs that have been submitted to the lab since 2017 when we started issuing grading points, grading reports for uh, CVDs. But one thing I did want to point out is that this total percentage is still very low. This, uh, the, the highest one we've seen is about 0.01%, or one in every 10,000 diamonds that come to GIA is a CVD grown. So we're still looking at very small overall percentages. <clears throat> also, we can look at the clarity features and the, the clarity grades. Uh, the, most of them are in the VVS2 to VS1 range. We do see some at the extremes of the IF to I2. And when we do see inclusions, what we typically see are non-diamond carbon, usually dark in color. And they can either be seen as pinpoints or congregated into clouds. But this is fairly representative of what we would see as inclusions in these CVDs when inclusions are present. <clears throat> Uh, also showing uh, the long wave UV fluorescence that we often see for these CVDs and uh, putting them into uh, two different categories because there's such a difference between what we saw from 2003 to 2013 and then from 2014 on. In the early years, 8% did show some measurable fluorescence and, when, and that was typically orange, yellow, or green. In the years since 2014, almost all of the diamond CVDs that we see have no fluorescence at all. And when the few, the very few that did show some were very, uh, faint blue. Also, a lot of the near colorless CVDs that we see have been HPHT treated. Uh, we've gone through all of the CVDs that have been submitted, and we've gone through each one and decided and determined whether they were uh, submitted to us as grown or whether they went through this HPHT processing after growth. And the reason they do that is because the manufacturer can grow the CVD faster, and, if, when they, and when they do grow it faster, it grows as brown. But they will grow it faster because they know they can do this HPHT processing afterwards to improve the color into the near colorless range. Uh, the process that they do with these CVDs is very similar to what is done for natural diamonds that have uh, plastic deformation and the, the brownish color there. It's a similar process and a similar effect. So we went through and saw how many of these near colorless diamonds, uh, CVDs, have been HPHT treated. And we can see that about a, a three quarters of them have gone uh, through this post-growth treatment. 
One way we tell that is by using uh, this deep UV fluorescence or diamond view. Uh, we showed earlier how effective it is for looking at natural diamonds. It's also good for looking at CVDs as well. And we can and one one thing we can tell immediately from looking at these is that there's a, a very good difference between what we see for diamond view in the as grown CVDs versus those that have been HPHT processed. There's a very distinct difference in the observed chemistry, and that affects your, your fluorescence color. So the as grown have a lot are dominated by nitrogen vacancy centers, and the ones we see for HPHT processing are mostly dominated by H3 and NV, and they have the greenish blue to green color. Also, one thing I want to point out on these CVDs is we can often see the presence is the presence of these layers here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they will often stop the process, clean off the growing CVD, and put it back in the reactor for further growth. And we can see that process by looking at the by uh, by a well-defined interface layer between uh, the different growth events. So we can see it in this diamond, and then right here, and then over on the on. There's a line right there. <clears throat> and the reason why that's important is that it's uh, such an obvious indicator that these uh, are CVD grown diamonds. So uh, we've done some research looking into that interface layer so that we can see what is causing that to show such different and brighter fluorescence. So this is one of the CVDs that it was grown in our New Jersey uh, facility. It, our substrate is a natural diamond, and then we grew five different CVD layers on top of that. <coughs> and and uh, it shows what it looks like indivisible. We can see each of the individual uh, CVD layers, and we can see that uh, also if you look at it in the fluorescence image and then also in the phosphorescence. We can see some distinct differences at the interfaces between the CVD layers. Uh, we can also do Raman mapping on the slice by looking straight from uh, the natural all the way up through each of the layers. And we can chronicle the changes in the defect centers as we go from the natural through all of the layers and also what happens at the interfaces. So over here on the far right of this plot, we have the natural stone. And then as, <clears throat> and then as we deposit the first layer, we see a huge spike in the vacancy-related centers. Uh, NV neutral, negative NV, and uh, negative silicon vacancy. All of those show a, a huge spike right here at the interface that then decays as we continue to grow that layer. When we add the second layer, we again see a spike in all of these vacancy-related centers. Similarly, we can look at other defects that are occurring within the CVD diamond, such as what we're seeing uh, at much higher concentrations within the CVD layer two. You're seeing much higher concentrations of as-grown defects, such as uh, those we see at 596, 597, and 468. And we're also seeing much higher concentrations of nickel in that particular layer. And if you look at the diamond itself, we can see that that is the brownest of all the CVD-grown layers that we are uh, seeing in this diamond. Also, uh, CVD process is able to create very unique products that just aren't duplicated in nature. Uh, this particular uh, diamond uh, CVD was created by uh, putting in massive amounts of silicon into the growth process. And, that's <clears throat> and what that does is it creates a very large uh, <clears throat> defect center for the negative silicon vacancy. And for the silicon vacancy. And that is what's causing this pink color here. When you expose it to UV light, you take that negative silicon vacancy and you change it into neutral. And that causes uh, the color to shift from pink to blue. And so this is one of my favorite types of CVDs because it is uh, a, such an interesting scientific phenomenon and you're also being able to switch reversibly and repeatably between two very attractive colors. Also, recently, we've uh, been seeing CVD overgrowth in the trade. Uh, this is something we've been investigating for the last 10 years. And uh, <clears throat> but, uh, we've only recently had a stone submit uh, uh, last, to GIA last summer. So I'm going to talk a few minutes about this one. Um, this was uh, a fancy blue as submitted, 0.33 carats. 
and the, and the blue color is due entirely due to this type 2B CVD grown layer of about 80 microns thickness right on the table. And you can tell easily that it is a composite product just from looking at the diamond view, where on the pavilion side you see the, the, uh, the fluorescence uh, typical of natural stones, and then on the table we do see the, the CVD layer. Uh, we, uh, some of the tests we've done on thinner samples of less than 80 microns, typically around 10, oh, thank you. Uh, typically around 10 microns, uh, those show much lower durability and, uh, and the, the blue color is not being maintained in those uh, thinner thickness uh, coatings. And so we are also curious about what occurs for the durability issues for these thicker uh, CVD layers as well. <clears throat> Since then, uh, we've either seen or, been or heard of uh, two other lab submissions of diamonds with CVD overgrowth. Uh, th uh, this one was submitted to NGTC in October of last year. It was an L color of 0.11 carat, and you can see that the majority uh, of the weight of, for that particular diamond was from the CVD. And then in the summer of this year, uh, <clears throat> The GIA Carlsbad lab uh, received in a fancy gray, grayish, greenish blue stone. Uh, it was about 0.64 carats, and uh, 10 points of that stone was due to a type 2B CVD layer. So, <clears throat> so for this stone, we believe the intent of it was to add weight to um, you know, more than double the weight of it. And then, um, and then this stone was to add the blue color, as we saw for that first one on the previous slide. <clears throat> also, I showed a picture of this earlier, but this uh, diamond is noteworthy because it's uh, such a large size CVD and is an attractive color. Uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, fancy, intense, uh, pinkish orange, and so I wanted to highlight this one because they are able to make these attractive color gem products that are in a larger size. One other thing I wanted to illustrate is uh, the diamond view image is, for this particular stone, due to the high amount of nitrogen vacancy centers in this, it makes it difficult to see the CVD growth-related features. So this is something that we're seeing a little more, and we've had to span out into other imaging techniques, such as cathetoluminescence, that uh, shows the growth striations for CVD better. I also wanted to mention a couple of other products uh, these are some flat plate samples that were sent to us by a CVD manufacturer that are also producing some faceted goods. I believe that this is some of their experimental work, but they'll probably be faceting similar material uh, in, the, in the next year or so. But <clears throat> these are um, two flat plates that are both uh, bluish in color, and they are both type 2B. And you can see from the IR spectra that they have massive amounts of boron. Uh, this uh, top one here has over 10,000 parts per billion of boron. And to put that in perspective, uh, I'm referring you back to some surveys we've done previously on type 2B natural diamonds, in which the highest value for that was 1,500 parts per billion, and the median for those were 300. And then and then a survey of some HPAHT grown diamonds in which the highest among those was 4630. So this diamond had two and a half times more boron than what we've seen in the highest of the HPAHT grown. So that's definitely one hallmark that we've seen among these uh, 2B CVDs. <clears throat> Another interesting product that we saw from that manufacturer was this 2.3 carat flat plate that uh, was determined to be fancy black. And it's a new cause for color of black color for diamond. The color is due to very strong nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, if you look in transmitted light, you can see that it has these red undertones due to the NV. But usually, if you have lower amounts of NV, then the diamond will appear as pink or as red. But this particular stone had so much NV that it just uh, created a black color for the stone. So I'm going to finish up just by uh, going over some of the identifiers that we use and that gemologists can use to uh, determine if a stone is a CVD-grown diamond. <clears throat> 
So firstly, you know, visually, uh, as we mentioned earlier, many of them have high clarity, uh, VVS2 uh, to VS1, but uh, they often have small black inclusions or pinpoints due to non-diamond carbon. Also, uh, in cross-polarizers, they often have a strain pattern. <coughs> um, that's very distinct from what we see in HPHT synthetics that often do not show a strain pattern, but it is quite similar to what we see in naturals. As we mentioned earlier, long wave UV is usually inert, especially among more recently grown CVDs, but they can show uh, green, yellow, or orange. In the short wave UV, we do see a little bit more variety. Um, if, it's an, if it's as ground, it's usually inert, but it can show the yellow, the orange, and then if it's HPHT process, we can see green fluorescence or green, green, blue phosphorescence. And then the deep UV imaging, uh, that can show a wide variety as I showed as well, that is, also indicates whether a stone has been as grown or HPHT treated. And then, uh, finally, for some of the advanced spectroscopy, uh, we can uh, do FTIR and we can see the, determine the diamond type. There are 2A, 1B, or 2B. Um, and then some as grown samples do show some CVD specific peaks. And then for photoluminescence, um, at liquid nitrogen temperature, we see things that are specific to CVD, such as the silicon vacancy and this 596597 doublet. And then Thank you very much, and if, um, <laughs> if you want to do any further reading, uh, I recommend that article. A question or two? I don't see anyone, so. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, I think he has oh. one. Hello, good morning, everybody. Just a quick question. Uh, how do you measure the quantity of the barn in the diamond? Which kind of method do you use? Um, there's a couple of different methods. Uh, one, is, uh, one was developed by um, Al Collins back in the early 70s, and then David Fisher, who I believe is in the audience, uh, helped advance it in his 2009 article. And that's uh, based off the area of the 2800 peak. And then Al Collins uh, more recently did, a, <clears throat> did an, a conversion for the 1290 peak that we see in these uh, 2B samples. And that's the one we had to use for these because the 2800 was so saturated because of the very high amount of boron. So we did a, use the conversion from, uh, from Alan Collins based on the 1290 peak. And uh, what is the margin error measuring the barn, I mean the, the range basically, how precisely we can measure this? Um, <clears throat> well, it's, well, for the, the samples we did, we did a full body uh, so there can be some local variations. Uh, we did some, also we did some uh, mapping for that particular stone that wasn't quite as effective as uh, our the normal way we collect FTIR. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sally. Uh, 